Hey guys, welcome back to Steel City Sports. So today I'm going to be ranking every single NFL head coach heading into the 2024 season. So if you're unfamiliar with how I do my rankings, it's simply going into next year, my number one goal being to win the Super Bowl. Who do I want my head coach to be the most? That's the guy at number one, obviously. And the guy I would least want would be obviously 32. So we're going to go through all that right now. I know there's more like analytical ways to compare coaches that you can look at their resumes, but I think this is honestly the best way to just look at my overall level of confidence and the overall philosophy, you know, for the game of football for these guys. So we're going to talk about all that. And I really want to hear what you guys have to say. Please comment down below who you think are some of the best coaches and who do you think are some of the worst head coaches. So let's get into the ranking right now. Picking off the list in dead last at 32, I have the New England Patriots new head coach of Gerard Mayo. So for all the rookie head coaches, I basically had to just go off of my prediction of what they're going to be because we've obviously never seen Gerard Mayo as a head coach. Uh, and I've said this time after time ever since he's gotten hired. I'm going to continue to say it throughout the season. This hire makes absolutely zero fucking sense whatsoever because if the philosophy behind firing Bill Belichick was we want to go in a new direction, we're kind of hitting the reset button on this franchise. The Patriot way died with Brady leaving. Bill's just not been very successful over the past couple of years. I'm all on board for that. I'm all on board for moving past Bill Belichick. You can clearly make the argument he's just kind of outdated for 2024. That's fine. Um, however, this move feels completely tone deaf because what did they do? They they fired Bill, but they brought in a guy in Gerard Mayo who's already you know in the on the Patriots staff. I don't think there's any other team in the NFL that would have hired him as a head coach, and they're basically going to be running a watered down version of Bill Belichick's system. So if we wanted to continue the quote unquote Patriot way, continue the culture of Bill Belichick then this hire makes no sense because you could have just fucking kept Bill Belichick to run Bill Belichick's system. So for me, this was a terrible move, especially whenever you're bringing in your new franchise quarterback, at least you hope, in Drake May. You should have went in a whole brand new direction, get an offensive guy in there, a young offensive guy, a, just a, a, a fresh breath of air moving past the Belichick years. But they did the complete opposite of that and basically doubled down and with Gerard Mayo, who, like I said, is going to be a watered-down version of Bill Belichick. And I, I just think the odds on Gerard Mayo working out as a head coach are very slim. Things are already getting weird with the Patriots. Their best player, Matthew Judon, they just had to fucking kick him out of practice. Um, you can make an argument they have the worst receiver core in the NFL with a project quarterback in Drake May, Jacoby Brissett. It, it's already kind of a mess, and I'd be shocked if Gerard Mayo made it past two years, honestly. And at 31, we have the Eagles head coach of Nick Sirianni. So if you just look at his resume on paper, it actually looks pretty impressive. His first year there, they won nine games. They made the playoffs. His second year there, they went to the Super Bowl. And last year, they started off 11-0 and made the playoffs again. So if you're just looking at that in a vacuum and looking at his resume on paper, you might be like, well, why the hell do you have him so low? Well, there's a couple reasons. Number one... I just think he's kind of a fucking moron. Anytime he's had his hands on offensive play calling, the offense has literally been a disaster, and he had to turn the play calling duties over to his offensive coordinator. That's how bad it was. And on top of that, he's a CEO head coach, so he doesn't call defensive plays, he doesn't call offensive plays, and he doesn't have personnel decisions. So what the fuck is Nick Sirianni providing to the Philadelphia Eagles other than being like a glorified cheerleader? And in terms of his record, I think it, he's – just simply benefited from coaching a stacked team with the Eagles. And any time in his brief tenure as the coach where they've had bad coordinators, they've been kind of screwed because Nick Sirianni is kind of an idiot and can't run the show if he doesn't have competent coordinators. And that's exactly why the Eagles self-imploded last year is they had coordinators that were in over their head and throughout the, the course of the season, they got exposed down the stretch and Sirianni was just too incompetent to overcome it. I think he's going to have a lot more success this year now that they have two rock-solid coordinators with Kellen Moore and Vic Fangio. But overall, I think the guy's kind of an idiot. Coming in at number 30, we have the Carolina Panthers' new head coach of Dave Canales. So similar to what I said about Gerard Mayo, I don't think any other team in the NFL would have hired this guy as a head coach. Um, with such a thin resume this guy has, I mean, he was, a, I think, a quarterback's coach for a couple years in Seattle, and then he had one year last year with Tampa as an offensive coordinator. So he's got a pretty thin resume, and it's not like Dave Canales and the Bucks were lighting it up on offense. They still had a really 
rocky season. They got off to a bad start. They kind of went on a good stretch towards the end of last year. But it's not like Dave Canales last year was being thrown around as like one of the top offensive coordinators out there. So I kind of think Carolina, they clearly were not going to get any of like the top head coaching candidates this year. So they kind of just went with Dave Canales. Uh, it kind of feels like a random hire to me. Um, I will give Dave Canales credit though, particularly for the playoff game against the Eagles where I think they had the perfect game plan the Buccaneers offense did, where their whole game plan was around just completely attacking and exposing the Eagles' terrible secondary. And that's what the Buccaneers did in that playoff game. They shredded that Eagles' secondary. So I'll give them credit for that, but that's one game. That's one playoff game. You're telling me he got this job basically based off of one game. I just don't know. Like like I said, I don't think any other team in the league would have hired this guy as a head coach. I don't know how it's going to play out. It's hard for me, though, to envision the Panthers being worse than they were last year. I mean, that was the ultimate nightmare season. So, I don't know. I, I, am, excuse me, I am willing to put him over Sirianni for the simple fact that he actually will do something for the Panthers and the fact that he will be the play caller. So he's actually providing something to his team. That's why I put him over Sirianni. And coming in at 29, we have the Saints head coach, Dennis Allen. So we're going to get into a stretch of coaches here where I really just think they should be coordinators given their skill set in 2024. I can't knock these guys for taking head coaching jobs. You know, top coordinator jobs are like two, three million dollars a year. That's a lot of money, but head coaching jobs start at like 12 million a year. So I cannot blame them for taking these jobs, but Dennis Allen and a couple of the other guys we're going to talk about here I think are just best suited to be coordinators. I kind of get why they hired him because Sean Payton just up and quit on them, and um, they just went with a guy who was a longtime member of their coaching staff with Dennis Allen, but I just don't think he brings anything special to the table as a head coach. Um, they have been one of the most drastically mediocre teams in the NFL you know, in his brief tenure as the head coach, and I just I don't – I don't know what the Saints saw last year between the pairing of Dennis Allen as head, their head coach and Derek Carr as their quarterback, and they're like, yeah, let's run that exact back roster, or excuse me, let's run that exact roster back. And I know that they got a new offensive coordinator, but from a roster standpoint and from a head coach standpoint, this is the exact same team. So I just don't really get what the Saints are doing. I don't. They feel like a directionless team, and Dennis Allen feels like a directionless head coach. And at 28, we have the Raiders head coach, Antonio Pierce. So he was obviously their interim head coach last year after the firing of McDaniels and then was given the full-time job this offseason. So I get why the Raiders did this. He's very well-liked by his players. I think he's a really good motivational-type coach. And I think he really does embody that style of, like, the old-school Raiders culture of, like, we're a tough team, we're going to beat the fuck out of you on the field, and we're just going to play our asses off on every play. So I really like that. I love the energy he brings, but from, a like, an X's and O's standpoint, a schematic standpoint – you just start looking around at the other guys in the AFC West division. Andy Reid, Jim Harbaugh, and Sean Payton. Like, Antonio Pierce isn't just, he's not even in those guys' galaxy. So it's, it's, it is kind of weird from that standpoint for the Raiders. Like, he does feel like a Raiders coach from a um, philosophy standpoint. But when you stack him up against the three other guys he's going to be playing every year twice, you're going to have the coaching disadvantage in all those matchups, and I just think he is so unproven as a, a true runner of an organization. You know, it's one thing to go on a run as an interim, which we've seen time after time in the NFL, where a head coach gets fired, they bring in an interim, and the team plays a lot better. It, there's no real proof that they're going to be able to continue that. I just don't know. And they're another team that is just completely stuck in mediocrity. They don't have a real long-term option at the quarterback position. I just don't see things working out great long term for him. At 27, we have the Cardinals head coach of Jonathan Gannon. So this guy could be my defensive coordinator any day of the week. I think he's a really bright defensive mind. When he was the defensive coordinator in Philadelphia, that defense was elite. They made the Super Bowl with him as their defensive coordinator, and that's why he got this job in Arizona. Going into last year, I had him ranked dead last, but I did bump him up a little because the Cardinals were a lot more feisty, even though their record was still pretty bad last year. They were a much more competitive team. They were in a lot of games more than I thought they would be. So, you know, he's not my cup of tea. He's not a guy I'd want as my head coach. Like like we said earlier, he's a guy that I would love to have as a coordinator, but I just don't, I don't see him as a head coach. He's fine, I guess.
26, we have the Titans' new head coach of Brian Callahan. So this is obviously a massive downgrade from Mike Vrabel. I still cannot believe Mike Vrabel is not a head coach, but that's another topic for another time. In terms of Brian Callahan, I just don't really know how to feel about him. You know, was he one of those guys in Cincinnati that actually contributed to the offense being good because he was a good play caller? Or was he one of those guys that was just kind of along for the ride because he had a lot of great talent on his offense with Burrow and Chase and Higgins and Boyd and Mixon? I don't know. That's what he's going to have to show us this year in Tennessee with kind of a raw prospect of Will Levis. I think they have a pretty good roster. You know, they brought in a lot of pretty good vets this offseason. So he is one of those guys that's definitely up in the air. I could see him going one way or another. Um, I just don't know. Uh, I will give him credit for the fact that his offense last year after Burrow went down with injury was actually pretty competent because I think everyone, myself included, thought when Burrow got hurt, the Bengals are done. They are Their season is over. However, they were able to stay still really competitive with Jake Browning, and they only missed the playoffs by one game. They still finished with an above 500 record despite Burrow getting hurt. So I'll give him and Zach Taylor a lot of credit for that. Will that translate? to Tennessee with him as the head coach. That remains to be seen. At 25, we have the Falcons' new head coach of Raheem Morris, a guy definitely deserving of a head coaching position. When you look at what he did last year as the Rams' defensive coordinator, he only had one first-rounder on his defense. That was Aaron Donald in the last year of his career. So most of that defense was made up of guys like fourth, fifth, sixth-round guys that were completely unproven, and he went in there and made them a really capable, really good defensive unit last year. And I think his best quality as a defensive coordinator now as a head coach is getting the most out of talent. You know, he doesn't need the five-star recruit guys. He doesn't need the blue chip prospects coming out of the draft. I think he does a phenomenal job of getting the most out of guys and developing people into star players. You just specifically look at Kobe Turner, a fourth round guy under Raheem Morris's defensive system last year thrived, had nine and a half sacks, I think should have won defensive rookie of the year. And if he's just able to recreate that in Atlanta, I think he's going to be a really good head coach. But I don't know. That's why I couldn't put him any higher than 25. Is Obviously, he's unproven. We don't know what he's going to be as a head coach. And I do think the situation is a little weird in Atlanta with that whole quarterback mess, which we've talked about a lot on the channel. I won't get into it now. But I could see things getting really weird in Atlanta given that quarterback position. But I definitely think Raheem Morris deserved to be a head coach just based off of how good of a job he did last year. And at 24, we have the Bears head coach, Matt Eberflus. So I'm honestly surprised that he kept this job just for the simple fact that there are a lot of moving parts with this Bears offseason, bringing in Caleb, bringing in Rome, bringing in Keenan Allen and DeAndre Swift. A lot of money and hype around this team. And it's just kind of crazy to me that the guy they decided to put in charge of all those moving pieces was Matt Eberflus. Like, it just feels really random to me. Um, I think he's a good defensive mind. Uh, he definitely showed after the Montez Sweat trade, their defense was actually really, really good. So I will give him credit for that. He figured out his side of the ball, which is defense. However, I feel like he is on a hot seat because we just said this is one of the most hyped teams in the entire NFL. And if you watched my NFC playoff teams prediction video, I did predict the Bears as a playoff team. So I feel like if the Bears have a disappointing year, and by disappointing, I mean like if they're like a seven-win team, eight-win team even, I could see Matt Eberflus fired. So this is a make-it-or-break-it year for Matt Eberflus. And at 23, we have the New York Jets head coach of Robert Sala. So I made a video a couple weeks back talking about a lot of issues I had with the Jets going into this year. And one of my biggest problems was I don't know if Robert Sala is a good head coach. I know he's a good defensive mind. He was a great coordinator with the 49ers. But in his tenure as the head coach of the Jets, it's been very rocky. We've seen glimpses here and there of the defense being great, but he doesn't call defense. So I think he's good at establishing the defensive culture, bringing the toughness and all that. I think he's a likable guy. But in terms of an overall manager of the game and an overall manager of a team as a head coach, I'm just not sold on Robert Sala. And um, I think it's pretty – it makes a lot of sense. It's pretty interesting that I put Iberflus and Sala right next to each other because I feel like they're both guys that are on hot seats. They're both uh, coaching hyped-up teams. And with Robert Sala's case, I feel like he's on an even hotter seat. If they don't make the playoffs this year, which I don't think they will – I think Robert Sala is going to get fired. I, I really do. If they're not a playoff team with all the hype, with Aaron being healthy, with a Super Bowl-level defense, 
And it's not like he's a new coach. He's been here. He's going into, what, his fourth or fifth year as the Jets head coach, and they've been nothing but kind of a shit show since he took over. Not saying it's all his fault, but eventually you do need to produce results, especially if Aaron stays healthy. So I think he's a good defensive mind. I just, we need to see it translate to wins on the field. And at 22, we have the Seahawks' brand new head coach of Mike McDonald. And yeah, it, it's going to take me a while to get used to Pete not being the Seahawks' head coach. You know, I'm pretty sure he was the third longest tenured head coach in the NFL behind Belichick and Tomlin. So to see Pete gone, it's going to take me a little bit to get used to that. But I do like this hire. I, it does feel like a breath of fresh air because even though Pete is a legend, he got a Super Bowl with Seattle. I just think it was time to move on. And, you know, of course, me with an offensive bias, I would have liked them to, to go more towards an offensive head coach. But I don't hate this hire because when you look at the defense over the past couple of years, Pete Carroll was a defensive guy. However, their defense sucked over the past two or three years. And it's not like this, this defense is devoid of talent. They have a really, really uh, high-end collection of young players, especially in that secondary. They're loaded in that secondary. So... For their defense to be that bad, I think it does reflect on Pete, and Pete was kind of outdated. I think it was the right move to move off him, and Mike McDonald, I think, has a lot of potential to be a really good head coach. When you look at what he's done as a coordinator, both the Harbaugh brothers really loved him, and last year's Baltimore's defensive coordinator. There were times last year where that defense was historically great, so... All he really has to do on this defense, I know it's a tough task, but he has to develop a main pass rusher to go with that secondary. The offense is loaded with talent, so if the offense is just, like, okay, the defense has potential to be really good. So I think Mike McDonald's is going to turn out to be a really good hire. At 21, we have the Washington Commanders' brand-new head coach of Dan Quinn. So when this initially happened, I was not a big fan of it whatsoever. I was like, what's the point of firing Ron Rivera if you're just going to bring in Dan, Dan Quinn? You know, like... To me, they're kind of the same guy. I get it from a scheme perspective, from an overall defensive philosophy perspective. They may differ here and there. But in the grand scheme of the NFL, Ron Revere and Dan Quinn, they're the same person to me. They're both defensive guys that should probably be defensive coordinators in 2024, both former head coaches that got to Super Bowls but didn't win one. So I just said this isn't really a needle mover. This doesn't really make a lot of sense. But I have since kind of warmed up to the hire because – it's not like the commander's organization was trying to hit a home run with the coach they hired here. They, they weren't going after Harbaugh. They weren't trying to make all kinds of noise with their new head coach. The commanders are simply just trying to establish their team as a real team. They've been a laughing stock in not just the NFL, but all of professional American sports for you know a decade plus now with the ownership of Dan Snyder, one of the worst owners in American sports. He's finally gone. He brought on a new ownership group with Josh Harris and a new GM, Adam Peters. This new regime is just trying to solidify the commanders. Hey, we're now a real franchise. You can now take us seriously. And Dan Quinn, he's a rock solid guy to have here and had a lot of success in Atlanta, had a lot of success in Seattle, and had a ton of success in Dallas, where I think you can argue he was arguably the best defensive coordinator in the NFL and was basically like a co-head coach with Mike McCarthy. Mike McCarthy was not even attending defensive meetings with the Cowboys because he was just letting Dan Quinn run the show. So now that I've kind of realized that, I'm not too, I'm not too um, as hard on this, uh, this, this hiring here. So I'm willing to give him the benefit of the doubt, and I'm kind of interested to see what Dan Quinn is going to do now that he's a head coach again. And at number 20, we have Dan Quinn's former boss, the Cowboys head coach, Mike McCarthy. So he's a fine... Offensive play caller, I think he's like a league average play caller. I don't think he does anything terribly bad or terribly great. I think he's just a fine league average play caller. Mike McCarthy's fatal flaw, though, is he's a terrible game manager. He's solely costed the Cowboys games because he doesn't know how to manage the clock. I think he's kind of a moron in that department. So in terms of play calling, that's fine. He can run the show. I'm good with that. He's a, he's proven time after time that he's a competent, more than competent play caller. But as a head coach, you got to do more than that. You have to be able to manage the team. You have to be able to manage the clock. And in those areas, I think Mike McCarthy just falls very flat, and I do think he should be an offensive coordinator. I think that would be the perfect job for him. That way he doesn't have to worry about clock management. He can simply focus on play calling. So maybe he will be an offensive coordinator soon because I do think he's on one of the hottest seats in the NFL right now, especially if Dallas misses the playoffs, which I think they are going to do that. I put out a video a couple weeks ago 
five reasons why I don't have the Cowboys making the playoffs. So go check that out if you didn't see that. But yeah, I, I think he could be gone. I'm kind of surprised he wasn't fired after getting embarrassed by his former team, the Green Bay Packers. So overall, good offensive mind, but I don't think he's a great leader or a great team manager. Coming in at 19, we have the Tampa Bay Buccaneers head coach of Todd Bull. So I think Todd Bowles saved his job this past year making playoffs because if Tampa doesn't make the playoffs, I think he would have been fired. When you look at how disappointing Tom Brady's final year was, I think Todd Bowles got the job because he was buddies with the previous head coach, Bruce Arians, and Brady signed off on it. But with Arians so far removed from the organization and with Brady now retired, it kind of felt like they wanted to go in a new direction. However, he made the playoffs, and they won a playoff game against the Eagles. So... He saved his job, and I give him a ton of credit for that, and I do think he is one of the brightest defensive minds in football right now. I think he's in the debate for the best defensive play caller in the NFL right now. You know That, that might not be as valuable as it was 20 years ago to have that, but you cannot deny this guy is a genius on the defensive side of the football, and people forget. Like, everyone talks about how great Brady and all of his receivers were that year Tampa won the Super Bowl, but Todd Bowles' defense in that game specifically was the reason why they won that game. That defense was phenomenal against the Chiefs in that Super Bowl. I give Todd Bowles a ton of credit for that. Even though I'm not a big fan of defensive head coaches, he's a really bright defensive mind. Coming in at 18, we have the Bengals head coach, Zach Taylor. So, for a long time, I was very iffy on Zach Taylor. I didn't know if he was that good or if he was pretty good. I just didn't know because I just didn't know if he was a guy who was kind of riding the coattails of Joe Burrow and his greatness, or was he a guy who was actually a contributing factor to them getting to that Super Bowl that year? I just didn't know, and I think this year he kind of proved that, no, he is a good head coach because when Joe Burrow went down this year with injury, everyone, myself included, thought, oh, that's it. The Bengals' season is over. They're finished. However, they went on to finish with an above 500 record. They were a really competitive team, and they were just one game out of making the playoffs with Jake Browning as their quarterback. So I will give Zach Taylor a lot of credit for that. Um, but this is a massive year in his career because he just lost his play caller with Brian Callahan. Is he going to be a Sirianni where he gets exposed for being a fraud now that he's lost his play caller? Or will he show everybody that, no, he's the reason why the Bengals have been so great? So it's a big year for Zach Taylor, kind of a prove-it year. We'll see what happens. At number 17, I have the New York Giants head coach of Brian Dable. So if you would have told me this after this rookie year that he would have been so low, well, I would have been pretty surprised because coming off his first year as the Giants head coach, I thought this guy was a rock star. I thought he was destined to be a top five head coach in the NFL. How the fuck couldn't you? I mean, he got Daniel Jones paid $40 million a year, you know, and he has a proven track record. Even in Buffalo, Josh Allen had his best years when Brian Dable was his play caller. So... This guy had a lot going for him, and then last year happened, and it was a fucking train wreck for the New York Giants, and I think you have to put a lot of that blame on Brian Dable um, and the GM. I think this is a poorly run team. Dable did the best with what he had, but that offense was dreadful to watch last year. I mean, Tommy DeVito became a star. I mean, (laughs) that's how big of a shit show the Giants were last year. So Dable, I think he has redeeming qualities. I still think he's a high-end play caller, but... This feels like a year, if they're a disaster again, we know the Maras are very quick to fire head coaches. I just don't know if he's going to stick around that long. We'll see. Um, but it's just crazy, his career trajectory in New York, based off of the the outlook on him after year one versus the outlook on him after year two, where now we're questioning, will he even keep this job that long? Whereas in year one, it looked like he was destined to be one of the best head coaches in the NFL. Now it's just kind of up in the air. I don't have a lot of confidence in him because their offensive personnel is still a mess and they lost Saquon. So we'll see about Brian Dable. Could potentially be on a hot seat, but that's actually going to be it for the video. I was going to, I was planning on doing all 32 in one video, but now that we're here, this video is well over 20 minutes. So if I do the entire coaches list, we'll be here for probably an hour or so. I don't know. So This will just be part one, and then in the next couple days, we'll put out part two, where we rank 16 through one. So if you made it this far, I really appreciate you listening, and please obviously leave your comments down below, some of your favorite coaches, some of your least favorite coaches, and please like and subscribe. Thanks for listening.